Good morning and welcome to the 10th meeting of the committee in 2019. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they are turned to silent. Our first item of business on the agenda today is an evidence session on international agreements. And I'd like to welcome to the meeting our witnesses, David Hennig, Dmitry Gruzbinski and Professor Alan Winters. Thank you for coming to give evidence to us today. Um, I, I'd like to start by quoting from a paper um, uh, written for the committee by our expert advisor, Dr Filippo Fontanelli, where he touches on uh, the impact of um, trade agreements on devolved competencies. And he points out that trade agreements often include rules on public procurement, rules on trade in agriculture and fisheries products, geographical indicators, environmental protection, uh, judicial cooperation, for example, even civil justice. So many areas of devolved competency uh, in Scotland would be affected by trade agreements. Um, what do, you, in your professional opinion, should be done in terms of mechanisms to ensure that uh, the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish uh, devolved institutions are involved in trade agreements going forward? And perhaps in your answers, you might like to draw from international experience with other uh, countries where they have um, subnational governments. Um. Well, let me start, and uh, I guess others will be able to add a lot more. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, very, very clearly, um, um, an administration, a parliament that has got responsibility for an area needs to be uh, heavily involved in the design of the mandate. So the very first thing one needs is to ensure that um, uh, in preparation for a trade deal, the Westminster um, Parliament and the government, the, the UK government, are fully informed and have uh, essentially some obligation to take seriously uh, the views of uh, the devolved um, ad administrations. Uh, as a joint committee, um, a possibility of um, high level of uh, regular guaranteed high level official committees are part of that. Uh, assuming that one can converge on a mandate that makes some sense, that's, um, as we are proving at the moment, in a sense, quite a large part of the battle of a successful negotiation is working out what it is you want and what you might expect. Thereafter, there needs to be um, a, a, um, a mechanism for keeping the devolved parties uh, informed and letting them, as it were, comment and modify their positions and offer advice. A lot of that, of course, has to be quite quiet. It would be done at official level, mostly. Uh, one can't necessarily uh, conduct everything at a parliamentary level. Um, but um, uh, at specific um, points in time, uh, then there is room for parliamentary scrutiny, um, uh, some of which may have to be private, but some of which can be public. Uh, if you are doing that process properly, you end up with a deal that you know more or less is going to satisfy all the parties. And then one needs to ensure that there is some way of taking account of devolved administrations, uh, devolved parliaments, views of the trade agreement. You cannot get into a position, I think, where one of the devolved parties can uh, automatically and un unconditionally veto a trade agreement. We have to have a system that brings uh, that cooperative process, as it were, to a, an agreed solution. So um, what, what, what I would add to that, a couple of things. I mean, the first is that I've said quite frequently in terms of trade agreements that the, one of the most important bases for any trade agreement is consensus, and that consensus needs to be political across parties, but also needs to be geographical, regional, taking into account, uh, d devolves what are the interests of, of Scotland. And I think to pick up from Alan's very very last point, you, you must avoid getting into even a position where uh, an, you know, an entire um, area like Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland 
cannot sim simply does not agree with the um, with with the final deal. If you get if you get into that situation, you have a really major political issue, as I'm sure you, you don't need me me to tell you. And therefore, you need to put in all the work up front to avo to avoid that. And it is, I think, the, the the way the way I see it is to put the mechanisms in in place such that by the end you you really are comfortable. Confident and comfortable that it uh, takes into account the main interests that, uh, that that Scotland has, and certainly when I was working on trade policy for the UK government prior to um, 2016, the referendum in an EU context, where we had there were always regular updates, and those updates always included representation from the. Uh, Scot from the Scottish government, there was all uh, they, they may they may well have been at official level just updating what was happening and providing that opportunity for input to be given, such that you know we we knew what the main priorities were for Scotland. We knew that it was important that those were delivered. Uh, let me let me first say it's an absolute honour and privilege to be here. Um, it's my first time, so I hope I don't screw it up. Feel free to yell at me if I do. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I wanted to pick up first on Professor Winter's point. Um, the mandate essentially is the Bible of trade negotiators, and it is fundamentally a hierarchy of interests, a hierarchy of offensive interests, what you are seeking in terms of commitments from the other side, and a hierarchy of defensive interests, what you are unprepared to move on uh, in response to requests for those other sides. That mandate is what we as negotiators use as our guiding star. Um, when we are in the room, the, the interests at the top of the hierarchy are those that we invest the most of our negotiating coin in defending um, or likewise pro uh, prosecuting uh, for offensive interests. So determining that mandate and making sure it reflects the interests of Scotland, making sure you fed into that mandate is absolutely crucial because once a negotiator is in the room, Everything but that mandate becomes secondary. Everything but that kind of north star fades into the distance. So if you're not on their radar by then, you're already three months behind. Um, in terms of devolved competencies and how to reflect the interests of Scotland, I would separate it mentally into kind of two boxes. First, there is the specific devolved competencies of, of the Scotland of, uh, of Wales of Northern Ireland. Um, this, as negotiators, uh, are things that are constitutionally or otherwise um, your remit. And when, for example, in Australia, we deal with issues that are uh, the, author the constitutional authority of the states, as trade negotiators, we tend to try to avoid getting into them if we can. Um, because in Australia, that does essentially add another layer of clearing process that we... Um, that means bringing on board a whole a whole nother group of people to essentially approve what we're doing. It makes it much, much more difficult to uh, to get a trade agreement done. So wherever possible in Australia, what we try have generally tried to do is stick to commitments that can be executed at the federal level. Um, now from the from the papers prepared for this committee and from the description before, that might be much more difficult in a, a United Kingdom context because the uh, extent of the devolved uh, competencies is greater. Um, but I think the second box is almost the more critical, which is what are the, the interests of Scotland and how do they feed into this mandate? As a trade negotiator, you are generally lucky if the analysis and economic data you have available to feed into the government's thinking on a mandate is economy-wide and occasionally, sometimes it's sector-specific in areas where there's an effective industry group. You much, much more rarely have information on what, say, a particular tariff line would do to Eastern Scotland, uh, what a particular commitment would mean for land production in, in, in a, in a sub-region. You operate at the national level. Um, and that's not through lack of interest. That's generally through lack of data, lack of capacity. Um, and because, frankly, um, civil servants sitting in a national capital don't have the same connection to local businesses and local interests as you would to those in Scotland. Can I just zoom 
Yeah. And, and that very point on a particular example that I think might be relevant to the point that you've just made, and that's the announcement earlier this month um, by the UK government uh, to go for liberalisation on a temporary basis in the event of no deal, in which across a whole range of areas they they announced a unilateral zero rated tariffs um, for goods coming in to the UK. Um, now, I was surprised to learn um, from some of our briefing papers that this, in we were told initially that these were these were areas that didn't have a great impact. They weren't in big areas of the UK economy, so they wouldn't be damaged. But I discovered today that they include dairy products. Now, I represent the southwest of Scotland, where the production of cheese is very important. It might not be huge in terms of the UK overall, <coughs> Um, but 73% tariffs on dairy exports would certainly hit our cheesemakers very hard um, if there were no tariffs on goods coming in. Um, do, do, in your view, is that an illustration of the fact that perhaps that industry wasn't pro the voice wasn't heard when that decision was made? So obviously I wasn't inside the DIT index U consultation process, but I think you can certainly look at the establishment of those no deal tariffs as a, as a microcosm of the preparation for a trade agreement process. What the UK government appears to have done is attempt to uh, is to attempt to replicate that process of working out well what are our hard defensive interests what are the what are the industries where we must absolutely maintain protection and what are the industries where we can pull back from it a bit or eliminate it entirely um, now from my conversations with uh, business lobbies and I haven't had these conversations with uh, devolved authorities um, there isn't a high level of satisfaction with the consultation that went into that the objective, I think, was to reflect, was to try to anticipate what those interests are and craft something that would, um, that would work, but that, that consultation didn't take place. And I think what you pointed out about the, the South of Scotland versus a, the government's line is really emblematic. Um, trade generally, um, while it has a huge impact on the economy in kind of dollar versus GDP terms doesn't tend to be that significant because most of a modern economy is us selling things to our neighbours and buying things from our neighbours. Um, so you can take something that will be absolutely pivotal to a region uh, like dairy in your part of Scotland and if you kind of look at that against the backdrop of the entire United Kingdom economy and the 64 million people who live in it, then it's barely a... You know, it's, it's three points behind the decibel in terms of its GDP impact or whatever. But for that community, not only for the people working in dairy, but for the, um, you know, for the pharmacy that relies on those people to have steady income to buy its services, for the local lawyer who handles their weddings and divorces, for the, the supermarket, the post office, it's absolutely pivotal for that region. Um, and it's entirely possible that without adequate consultation and feed-in, that's just, it, it's not that it was deliberately ignored, it just never rose, it just never rose up as an issue. Professor Winters. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the, um, uh, the temporary um, uh, tariff liberalization which they announced uh, for no deal um, illustrates the points that are important very clearly. I think one has to accept that it was done in rather exceptional circumstances. It was, it, there was, uh, the, the DIT has uh, sort of confessed there was very little consultation. They clearly viewed it as politically very sensitive and wanted to keep it quiet. And um, so I think that one can use it as an illustration of what can go wrong. One shouldn't necessarily use it uh, as an indication that going forward over the next decade or so, that is exactly how Westminster and Whitehall will always um, behave. I mean, one illustration of how, what a patch-up it was, uh, if you look at it, you'll notice that the tariffs on a lot of agricultural products are actually defined in euro. So when we take control and Americans sell us dairy goods that they will sell in pounds here and price in dollars in America, they have to pay euros to get them in. Yeah, I think it was just a, a real patch-up. 
So what, I, what I'd add to, to that is that the, the time factor, I mean, trade agreements is always, um, are always criticised because they take so long. Well, you'll see the, this, is the, this is what happens if trade agreements don't take a long time, is that suddenly you get a tariff announcement. Because what needs to happen is that government goes to, to business, the Scottish government, everybody, and says, right, we're going to make a tariff announcement. What have you got to, you know, w what do you want to say about all the different industries? And then, frankly, that process needs to carry on, needs to iterate numerous times because... Business doesn't necessarily know, and all the different subsectors don't necessarily know the detail. You have to do some really serious analysis to get to get this right. That ta that takes time. Frequently, it's not the negotiation with the other country that takes the time as much as it's the negotiation with yourselves. Do we know everything we need to know about that region, this subsector, the impacts? The final decision is uh, as to tariffs will always be taken in secret by the pe by the people doing it because they have to. Uh, judge some pretty sensitive trade-offs, but um, you have to be certain that you've had really sufficient time to have contributed, and you know. So you and, and they weren't certain, and the business interests in turn. You have to be. We have to be telling business. You have to be specific. What it you know? What is going to really hit you? What amount is there? A, is there an amount? What 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 quota? What tariff? And and that's the process, and it takes time. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, convener. Uh, one of the drivers for uh, leaving the EU from some is the ability then of the UK to make new trade deals, uh, principally with America, with, um, with New Zealand, with China, the other ones that are frequently mentioned. Uh, you talked about timescales and negotiations. So the two questions initially is, what do you think the timeframes for any new deals in these other countries would be? And also, what type of Brexit would facilitate the ability to make those trade deals? And if we were in some kind of agreement with the EU, what impact would that have on the ability to make individual trade deals? Um, so the, the, the EU is actually one of the slower uh, countries or blocks in, in terms of making trade agreements. They frequently can take five to, to eight years, would be my suggested timescale for an EU trade agreement. The US has actually done them more quickly in the past, uh, two to three years, let us say, from start of negotiations to impl implementation. But that's very much um, if pretty much you're taking the US terms and just contributing a little bit. If you are into a serious negotiation, it is going to take longer. It is particularly going to take longer because we don't actually yet know in all the levels of detail what Dimitri was talking about, about all of our specific interests. However, that is completely theoret theoretical because uh, those countries, the, the US and New Zealand and, and others, have made it entirely clear that they're actually going to be waiting for what kind of relationship we have with the EU and for that to be defined. And that applies even in a no-deal scenario because even advocates of no-deal are saying that, well, we will want some deals with, 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 the, uh, with the EU – and there is going to be huge amounts of tension in areas where there is conflict between the EU and the US, and we're talking food standards here and the famous chlor chlorinated chicken, that decision is not going to come in any way easily. The US are US trade officials, they're very experienced, they're well aware of the fact that the, the UK has big decisions to make. They don't expect that talks can proceed particularly quickly, um, and therefore almost regardless of what type of Brexit it is, our trade deals are going to be slow because we don't know what we want and the other countries are waiting to see what happens for our relationship with the, with the EU. Now, in the event that it's a customs union and that got the, the closest vote yesterday, our trade agreements are going to be extremely li limited because either they are going to have to follow the, the tariffs of the European U Union, in which case, for, cer for certain, the US is not going to want to... Uh, uh, play on play on that basis. I'm pretty sure, or they're going to have to be related to services, which we haven't mentioned, but is particularly tricky uh, to do to do services only trade agreements. In fact, there are, I think there are only one or two in in the world. So I think in all circumstances, we're talking about a pretty slow process. Yeah, I would certainly um, <clears throat> uh, echo all of that. Uh, to pick up the point about services, services are extremely difficult. Uh, to um, negotiate liberalisation agreements for. There are, in fact, there's only one, uh, the WTO only records one services-only 
general trade agreement, and that's between the European Union and the EFTA countries, where we know there's an extremely deep relationship. It just happens that the goods section and the services section are written down in different treaties. Uh, so the notion that don't worry if we've pinned the goods market down by agreeing a customs union or having unilateral um, uh, move to uh, zero tariffs ourselves, people will come along and want to negotiate service agreements with us is actually just a fallacy. We are scarily efficient in services. And most trade agreements involve trying to get something and give up a little bit. Um, what we're offering to other countries around the world is we can't give you anything in goods where you are efficient. Uh, and if you open your doors to us in services, we will be a really fierce competitor. Uh, so they, don't, they won't turn up. So I think we need to be really clear that uh, services-only agreements will be extraordinarily hard work. I think I would say all trade agreements are going to be pretty hard work. Uh, I, I, I think there's a lot of um, triumphalism in the hypothetical when it comes to trade agreements and talking about all of the glorious markets that will be that will be open. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that in, uh, as Professor Winters was illustrating there, your greatest gains in a trade agreement, uh, potential gains rather, are in areas that the your counterparty protects the most. Just, just naturally, if they've got, if you're, uh, you're looking to eliminate their highest tariffs, uh, those highest tariffs generally tend to be high for a reason, and it's generally because there is a compelling and effective domestic argument, often backed by a very effective and persuasive lobby that keeps that tariff high and has kept it high in the face of liberalisation pressures from every direction for decades, sometimes you know up to up to a century. Um, so when you are trying to, to charge up that hill, it is steep indeed. Uh, on the question of timescales, I think David makes a, makes a critical point. Trade agreements don't take a long time because trade negotiators are very slow typers. Um, they take a long time because when you start, you've got 650 paragraphs in square brackets because you disagree on everything but 50, 50 paragraphs of standard text, and it takes a long time to resolve 650 disagreements and align your requests and their offers uh, across your schedules. Um, the amount of time it takes a trade agreement it depends entirely on how flexible um, and accommodating you are willing to be to the interests of the other side. Uh, if you walk into a trade agreement and they, uh, the other side tables a text and tables a request and you go, yep and yep and don't worry about anything we've asked for, you can get the trade agreement done in 45 minutes. They will just copy paste their last one plus some requests. But I think if the UK is going to take this seriously, and I would very much encourage them to do so, then you know, for, for scale, sense of time scales, the Australian free trade agreements with Korea, Japan, and China took five, seven, and ten years, uh, respectively. I think I've got that order right. Um, that is a that is a sense of time scales, and that occurred because there were fundamental clashes of uh, what we needed to see and what they were w willing to give and vice versa. The last point I make also to pick up on something that David said in terms of the likelihood that other countries will wait to see what shakes out in terms of UK and EU relations. David's 100% right on standards alignment, but there's a more fundamental point in terms of goods. Um, when I, as a trade negotiator, am looking at an offer that your side has made, so for example, the United Kingdom turns around to Australia and says, we will, pr we will drop this tariff on wheat, for example, uh, and in exchange we would like this, this and this. The way I would evaluate if that is a good offer, if that's a reasonable exchange, is by comparing first what, what will that tariff dropping mean for my producers vis-a-vis -vis United Kingdom producers, but secondly, what will it mean vis-a-vis -vis Australian competitors? And until I know whether EU receives full unlimited market access in a free trade agreement that eliminates all tariffs, or if it's facing WTO tariffs, it's very hard for me to price the value of UK offers because I don't know if my major competitors get zero tariffs or potentially lock out quotas, for example. So it actually, it actually actively makes it difficult for your counterparties to make trade agreements they can, uh, they can count on as being balanced because they don't have the answer to that puzzle yet. Um, just 
described a very complicated um, and lengthy <laughs> process. Um, and obviously the UK has been a member of the EU and trade deals we've been involved in have been, the EU has been the lead negotiator. Do you think there are, um, is there issues with lack of experience within the UK government? Have we been, we haven't been actively engaged in negotiating these type of trade deals for a long time. And you described the US as quite an aggressive um, negotiator. What do you think the UK government needs to do in order to uh, be able to com to negotiate these type of deals and, and be involved at that level? Well, it clearly needs a lot of expertise, but it also very clearly needs to think very hard about what's going on before it you know, gets into that negotiation. Um, uh, trade negotiations, in one sense, are like other negotiations, you know, like you know, a domestic negotiation. Civil servants do that all the time. They come along with their own environment, sort of the World Trade Organization. They come along with their own vocabulary and conventions. Um, but in a sense, the real key is to have people... I think the real key is, one, to understand what you want and what you're going to be prepared to pay for it and essentially have uh, conducted um, a secure negotiation at home so you're negotiating from a strong base. Then you need at least some people who know the way the system works. Um, a trade negotiation is a funny sort of business. It's a sort of mixture of commerce and law. It's, these are people who are tough negotiators. That's what they do. They don't, uh, they don't give any favours. Uh, so I think the most important thing is to be very realistic about it, to be really clear what you want, and understand that you will not patch it up by Christmas. And, and, and it's not necessarily about numbers. So you, the Office of the US Trade Representative is actually surprisingly small. There's only about 200 full-time members of staff there, but they're drawing on expertise from across the government. So not just about whether you've got enough negotiators in a department for international trade, but do all the other government departments have people who can be dedicated to this and to understand trade? Do people, are, are there enough people in the Scottish government and the Welsh, and the Welsh Assembly who are going to be able to un understand and to be able to get all the information required? Have you set up the domestic processes? Clearly not. We've already, we've already discussed that. In order to make sure that everybody has a chance to, to, to contribute wi with, within that. Um, and, and, and so it, this is the point about being, making sure you are, full, you are fully prepared before you even, before you even start to, to, to do that. And to go in first against the US is, um, in, 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 old, uh, in, in old language of the civil service, that's a very brave step to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to do that against some of the most uh, f fearsome uh, negotiators that you're going to find anywhere. But then again, there's no country I can think of that would be easy to negotiate a tra trade deal with because they've all done this before and they've all got already their processes in place, and we haven't. And as far as I can tell, we still, we still haven't. So, or as of, let us say, it was going to be in two weeks' time, we wouldn't be ready. Yeah. Thank you, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, I'd like to come onto the issue of uh, WTO rules and the possibility, uh, as unpopular as it is, of a no deal scenario. I know we've touched briefly on the temporary tariff regime, uh, and I appreciate what. Uh, Mr. Hennig said around in an ideal world the process by which you would come up with such a scheme but I guess in an ideal world the plan was we weren't days away from, from potentially leaving uh, uh, the status quo so uh, perhaps uh, ministers didn't have the benefit of time in that respect but if, they, if there is a scenario and it is just an if because all of this is just one big if because none of us know um, that we do have to rely and fall back on WTO rules. Could someone with expertise of the WTO just explain to the committee what that world looks like in terms of how we trade with other countries, how we as a third country trades with the EU, and what those international standards and protocols may look like? Sure. Um, so, uh, fun fundamentally, what WTO rules are, are a minimum baseline. If you think of the EU single market and customs union uh, as a very advanced stage of integration, where uh, which has progressively eliminated 
a whole range of barriers and bound governments not to implement a whole range of barriers to trade or conditions about the way trade can happen. The WTO is an absolute baseline. It is a minimum, it is a minimum standard of non-interference or, lim or interference limitation in international trade that now 164 members have signed up to. So in practice, what uh, WTO Brexit will mean is that the obligations on the EU and the United Kingdom vis-a-vis -vis one another will be to treat trade flows between them um, in the same way that they treat the member, the WTO member, with whom they have no uh, free trade agreements, no trade-related agreements of any kind. Um, there aren't many of those, so the closest analog is Venezuela. So I think if you have a package, if you picture a package now that is heading from, from Edinburgh to, to Paris, uh, that receives a, a very advanced degree of treatment. If you are a Venezuelan exporter trying to send a goods consignment to Paris, you find yourself facing much higher, much higher fees, much greater degrees of paperwork. Um, and the EU is in a way under WTO rules, under a principle called most favored nation status, has to apply those Venezuelan rules to, to the United Kingdom. Um, now that's, that's an oversimplification, but that's essentially what it means. Um, for UK businesses, even with all of the commendable measures that the um, governments on both sides have already put in place to, to mitigate against that shock, um, it's likely to be a very sharp shock indeed in, in two ways. Um, first, uh, there's the, the question of tariffs. Um, the UK has indicated it will liberalize a range of tariffs um, on a most favored nation basis to allow imports to flow in uh, more readily than they otherwise would. The EU has made no such indication, no such implication as far as I'm aware. Um, so if there is no deal, the UK will absolutely face those tariffs. Anyone suggesting otherwise under unicorn schemes like Article 24 of GATT or mysterious last minute arrangements um, is doing so without any basis on EU statements or kind of indications. Um, so they will face tariffs. That's the, the first shock. The second shock is just in terms of paperwork and procedures. Uh, the EU Single Market and Customs Union has done its very, very best to make moving something from uh, Glasgow to Paris as easy as moving it from Glasgow to Edinburgh in terms of paperwork and, and requirements. They haven't quite gotten all the way there, but they've gotten far closer than almost anyone else anywhere in, in human history. Um, compared to that, moving something internationally is actually a significant burden of paperwork. There is a reason that the customs brokerage industry exists. There is a reason that freight forwarders are a thing. And that is because navigating the bureaucracy of international trade, which, is, which every single country has, is a really hard lift. And any business in the United Kingdom or in Scotland that has only ever traded within the European Union will have never encountered that before. There is a, there is a, the EORI numbers, the, the basically registering as an import, as an exporter. Um, if you have never traded as a business outside of the EU, chances are you don't even have that registration. You're not registered as an exporter because you didn't have to be. Um, and EORI registration numbers which are being tracked are still, I think, hundreds of thousands below where they need to be. So tens and tens of thousands of UK businesses will not be eligible to export. They will not be the type of registered firm that can export goods to markets they could easily export to the previous day because the paperwork requirements will just kick in. And even if that's mitigated in part um, on the UK import side, and I trust the European Commission will also do what it can to mitigate that. In the long term, in addition to the shock, there is also the, every additional bit of paperwork costs money and every additional paperwork costs time. And business models in the UK right now, the ones exporting to the EU, are built around not having to do that. If they do have to do that, that raises their costs of doing business and may push them outside of their competitiveness margins. So it's, um, I don't want to overstate this, but I actually really struggle to overstate it at the same time. This is a really, really serious and sharp shock 
that should not be should not be dismissed. Understatement. Understatement. You only talked about goods. There's also an impact on services. So I've, uh, um, and, and, and I list two particular areas that's an impact on services. There's a, there's a lot of um, folk from across the, across the UK who are selling services who basically involving th them going to work ac across uh, the EU. We are entirely unclear what the regime for that will be. There are many people in, I don't know, IT services who rely on um, f working across Europe wherever they're needed. There are many people in some in, in some fields that we're, re you know, we have some great skills in. And I've come across people who kind of go around Europe uh, giving advice on, on wind turbines or, you know, off offshore oil and gas installations is another is another one. And I think there's quite a quite a few of those um, people here in here in Scotland who are going to find that their rights to work across Europe are um, un entirely unclear after uh, in the event of a no-deal Brexit. And when I say entirely unclear, it, you know, to, the, to them they may well not be able to do it. And th many of them are fearing that they will not be able to provide their services in the event of a, in the event of a no-deal Brexit. Even if they themselves could travel to to work, there are uh, the services schedules at the WTO, which tells you what you can and can't supply in terms of services as another country, and they are far below the, the, the uh, single market integration. It is often said there is no such thing as the single market for services in the EU. It is incorrectly said. There is that, you know, generally you do have the right to travel anywhere around the EU and, and provide services under WTO. You, you know, generally there's an awful lot of exceptions to you being able to, to do that. Can I add, whilst it's just one further wrinkle, um, the, 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 the WTO rules will also constrain the way that Britain can conduct its own trade policy. I mean, exactly as they constrain the European Union. But, for instance, uh, we will only be able, to, in terms of WTO rules, to be able to calculate and impose uh, anti-dumping duties in a moderately disciplined way. There will be disciplines on subsidies. Uh, there is the multi <coughs> pardon me, most favoured nation discipline that we have to charge the same tariff to every partner with whom we don't have a full free trade agreement. So the WTO minimum, which uh, Dimitri talked about, will apply to us. And I have some conversations with people in government who think that after Brexit they'll be completely free to do whatever comes into their heads. Well, the WTO has over 70 years actually uh, you know, uh, constrained a fair amount of bad behaviour in the trading system, and it will continue to do so uh, for us. Uh, one conversation I had in America a year ago, I guess, a bit more than a year ago, I think, uh, warned me that um, the, <clears throat> the American, the USTR in America is um, preparing to bring a large number of WTO disputes to Britain um, because essentially when we take over our own trade policy, all the things about EU trade policy that the United States hates will now be owned by us. We will have voluntarily introduced things like a ban on hormone-fed beef, which is generally held to be WTO inconsistent, and that they've got fed up of beating against the brick wall of the, United, uh, of the um, European Union, but they are very clear that when it's ours, Little Britain, they'll come and talk to us. So the WTO is, rules will constrain us and will condition the way that we conduct our trade policy. Very much. Uh, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Convener. It's uh, just a couple of points of uh, clarification that came up from your, uh, your answers there. So you mentioned uh, in terms of selling of goods uh, internationally. How does that then affect uh, businesses if they are selling goods on the likes of an Amazon website or, uh, or an eBay website? How does that affect these businesses if they don't have that particular registration? So it'll generally depend on how they're, they're structured around how they actually do this selling, whether they are using Amazon, whether they are effectively selling to Amazon. So it goes to an Amazon warehouse and the Amazon warehouse distributes, in which case Amazon will take care of it. They've got the world's best logistics empire. That's not a problem. However, if you're using the Amazon marketplace, you're essentially an, an independent vendor. So you are, uh, or like eBay is a really good example of this. So you have your own little store. Uh, it is listed on eBay. Somebody goes online and buys your crocheted hat. And then you get the order and you send it to them yourself. 
Um, the ability, uh, the extent to which you can do that might be curtailed if you are... Um, this gets a little bit complicated when we're talking about e-commerce because a lot of countries have minimum thresholds where if you're sending like a $30 hat that you've that somebody's bought from you online, then it's tariff free. It's large. It's it's much easier. But if you are selling higher va uh, value or higher volume goods, then you might and you're selling them into the EU, um, then you might suddenly face having to to implement all of these procedures if you want to kind of be an exporter and be square with all of the laws. And you might find yourself facing barriers. To give you an example, I live in I live in Switzerland, and it is virtually impossible for me to buy anything on Amazon because the customs costs and the procedures are actually quite difficult in Switzerland. And so what everyone I know who lives in Geneva does is have a friend across the border in France to whom, and I swear to God this is true, there is a massive industry in France of basically mailboxes where Amazon deliveries go because selling something into Switzerland on uh, via online retailers is considered so much more onerous, it's worth jumping in a car and driving to, um, you know, you've had on Le Bois and, and getting a, and picking up your package there. Um, so it is a barrier. Okay, uh, okay thanks for that. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's an interesting example regarding France. Uh, on another point, uh, just regarding the, the services, um, also the, the large oil and gas uh, uh, companies are uh, obviously global. Uh, but they will employ many uh, small uh, contractors. So uh, if, uh, say, yeah, a large, uh, a large uh, oil and gas company was uh, bringing in contractors and sending them to links of either the US or Kazakhstan or African countries, what would then happen in that example regarding the, uh, the services and any potential additional costs? So in the case of some of those countries, there is no... The, yeah, the, the WTO rules already already apply, and the large company is taking care of it and working out how they. So, so for the large in, the, in Kazakhstan, the, the large will will be this compared to the will will contract. you know they may well have set up as a, you know they may well have set up that they will probably have set up a subsidiary in those in those in those countries, and that they will be compl complying with the uh, complying with the local laws. So in that kind of in that kind of supply chain ex example, now there may be new obstructions obstacles to them doing it in Europe. I mean, they already have obstacles. And they used where, the, where you have those major companies bringing in people in countries like, I don't know, Kazakhstan is probably a good example. You know, they will spend a lot of time at the moment complying with the local laws to allow them to do that. At the moment, they will spend a lot less m money and time complying with the local laws in the EU because EU, UK, there's not that too many barriers. It just means it will be harder for the, for the large companies to bring in a UK... Um, supplier and they may choose if they you know if there's a choice and it comes back to Dimitri's point one of the things we've got to measure here is not you know the UK in isolation but the UK against other countries as competitors and so in the future if there is a choice between say a UK or an Irish company to bring in as a as a supplier for for uh, for something they may say well it's just I've got 10 less laws to comply with if I bring in an Irish company than if I bring in a UK company. Therefore, I'll bring in the, the Irish company. So it applies in services what applies in, what Dimitri's already said applies in goods, which is to say it's extra paperwork, it's extra rules to go through. The single market is a pretty permissive environment in a sense of you can more or less do what you want unless there's you know, specifically laws against it. Whereas in, the, in a WTO field, you've got to go through each law in turn to see whether you're actually allowed to do what you do and how to get around it. I think remember with the example that you quoted, uh, Mr. McMillan, is that um, you're dealing with visa regulations which are, for some countries, right outside the purview of trade agreements, the US, for instance, uh, and anyway are you know, hugely, hugely sensitive. So while a large company may, in a trade agreement, have negotiated the right, or the government has given large companies the right to move key workers uh, that they are employed, uh, who have been employed already by the company, into do particular jobs, uh, that is still constrained, but it exists. When it comes to small contractors, uh, you really are absolutely dependent on what the local visa regulations are. And now, if we're talking about how will um, uh, the remainder of the European Union treat us, visas are basically a national competence. We're going to have 27 sets of trouble to think about, um, and generally they are not very liberal. So I think the 
example that you quoted about the large company wanting to be able to direct small contractors, as it were, on their own without an employment relationship with that large company, um, one's looking at a considerable increase in difficulty. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Uh, Ross Greer. Thanks, Convener. Um, I'd like to turn to the uh, rollover or not of uh, much of the treaties that currently apply to us as an EU member state. It's clearly not gone as swimmingly or triumphantly as Liam Fox predicted a couple of years ago. And some relatively significant uh, deals like with uh, Turkey or with Japan have, have not been uh, rolled over yet. Um, what is what will the noticeable impact of a failure to roll over these deals be on UK trade? The, in general, uh, the situation will be uh, when we drop out of the European Union and therefore drop out of the European Union's trade agreements uh, that the uh, partner countries will be obliged to treat us as third countries and we will be facing their tariffs, we will be obliged to treat them as third countries and they will face our tariffs, uh, whatever they happen to be. Uh, there will, in addition, uh, quite uh, in some, some of these trade agreements do have sort of a, a degree of service liberalisation and we will fall outside that as well. There are sort of smatterings of mutual recognition in uh, some of the trade agreements. We will, will fall outside of that. So in principle, we will lose um, our, our market access will deteriorate in what amounts to nearly 15% of our exports. Of that 15%, the government has negotiated rollover trade agreements in 2.2% of the 15%. And even the rollover agreements that it has negotiated actually do not guarantee a perfect replication of current trading conditions. Um, so um, the uh, rollover agreements are potentially quite important. Uh, there, are, as you say, they haven't gone very well. There are sort of different, uh, different agreements are different degrees of distance from the finishing line. Uh, it is very, very clear, for instance, that Turkey is extremely difficult and uh, because it's so, it is so tied up with the European Union. Uh, the Japanese are immensely irritated with us. The South Koreans think they will get a better deal. These are all you know, countries that are going to take quite a long time. Some others are said to be imminent. Norway, we are told, is imminent. Uh, but Norway will only deal with goods. They can't uh, do an agreement with us because they essentially are in the single market, and that very, very much limits what they can offer to us when we are a third country. So these uh, rollover agreements, or the absence thereof, or, uh, and the failings thereof, uh, is, is moderately serious news, I think. So what I, what I would add to that, I mean, there was clearly over-optimism at the start. I think there was an assumption that other countries would roll over agreements because trade was good and therefore they would do this. Well, unfortunately, negotiators don't quite work like that, as uh, Dimitri has sort of already been outlining. Negotiators want things. They, they, you know, that's what they're, they're trained to, to do. And so us going to other countries and saying, you know, please Nick, roll this over, they were always going to say, well, what do, what do we get from this? What's, um, and so... Yeah, and we weren't really, you know, there was over optimism that this could be done quickly, that other people wouldn't wouldn't want things, and we weren't we aren't necessarily well set up to understand whether we can offer something in in return. I mean, in terms of the noticeable impact on that, I think what we've got to understand is that at an economy wide level, individual trade agreements are fra you know fractions of one percent of, of of GDP, if if that. So yeah. Um, getting a successful trade agreement with some of these countries will only be worth 0.1 or 0.2 percent of GDP so losing the, losing them could you know will e will equally um, take off a fraction at an economy wide level but for individual companies who are required who are using these trade agreements they could be really quite devastating and so for example a lot of um, in the in the example of Korea a lot of um, it opened the Korea trade agreement opened up legal the legal services market to uh, UK, UK uh, pr providers it was really hard fought and the Koreans never really quite liked that bit anyway but they, they've gone there now it never quite opened up as much as they hoped but it did open up a bit now if you're those legal services companies based in the UK you're about to lose that right again from 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 doing it that you have so 
you know, that that would be that would be one example, and there will be other and there will be other exporters of particular goods who will suddenly find themselves uncompetitive. In the case of Turkey, there's an awful lot of UK companies who are importing from Turkey at the at the moment. Now, under the uh, if if it was no deal under the under the no deal tariffs, uh, many, you know what they're going to have to do is switch potentially from from Turkey to other uh, to other sources. Now, they may be they may be able to to do that. Uh, but they, clearly, that that is going to become potentially come at some kind of cost and re, and rerouting of supply chains. So, and, and Turkey is also, by the way, a good case of the of the over optimism. Though you know, even last year, um, officials and a minister was saying we will we will we are confident we will be able to roll over the Turkey agreement. But Turkey has always been almost impossible to roll over because it's part of the uh, it has a customs union with the EU. So I, I was never qu- we were never quite sure how they were so confident. Um, but yeah, the impact on indiv- on individual companies who are using these agreements will be um, could, could well be very very severe at an economy wide level. Uh, it, it's maybe you know it, it it takes a hit, but not necessarily a huge hit. I think if you're looking for a kind of microcosm example of what this looks like. Uh, the U.S. negotiated TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and then pulled out before it was implemented. And now what U.S. farmers are finding is that they are being undercut in the Japanese market, which is quite a lucrative market, by Australian producers. Now, as an Australian producer, I don't see any problem with this whatsoever. I think this is wonderful. But they're now. this is a major problem for, for the U.S. Now, across the scope of the U.S. economy, uh, agricultural exports to Japan do not register as a as a blip. It's a thirteen trillion dollar economy or something. But for those farmers who relied on those exports, it is a significant blur. And this is kind of the same situation you're going to see if Japan, Turkey, and um, Korea aren't rolled over. Which is as David was saying, as Alan was saying, um, you have to get down to that kind of regional level. Uh, I was talking about at the start, and there are going to be problems there. Short of the uh, deal with uh, Norway and Iceland, if that comes to pass, and we s- there seem to be indications that it, it has been agreed, but no one's seen any text. Um, so sh- short of that, the rollover with Switzerland is the, the most significant one that has been announced, and there is clarity on so far. I suppose, Dimitri, you maybe have some specific knowledge on this. Does this rollover mean that trade with Switzerland will continue exactly as it was the day before Brexit, or... Are these rollover agreements, in fact, somewhat different to what they are rolling over from? Uh, so, so I'm I'm not. Uh, I haven't studied it in absolute great detail. My understanding from um, uh, the work of Peter Umfakorn, who's done probably the most detailed study of this, is that the Swiss agreement is is structured in this way. If the withdrawal agreement with the EU is passed, then the agreement with Switzerland is very very close to current arrangements. Um, If it does not, and there is a no deal, then the agreement with Switzerland kicks in anyway, but it is not quite, it doesn't quite replicate um, what the UK currently has with Switzerland under the EU, um, though it comes it comes within within reaching distance, but there are individual areas of di- of divergence. But I think Switzerland's probably of all of the agreements with developed countries. I think Switzerland's probably the one that's come closest to saying continuity Uber alles. Let's just let's see what we can do to have uh, under the mind the gap strategy to make sure that there's no rough rough transition. Other countries are playing much more hardball. Yes, absolutely. I had a young colleague looking at this actually just a couple of days ago. Uh, There are a couple of places. Oh, well, I think your paper uh, actually mentioned these and the paper from the Welsh Assembly. Um, There are issues over mutual recognition. So in a number of areas, there are 20 uh, agreements between Switzerland and the European Union on mutual recognition of certification that the EU recognises Swiss certification of that uh, good meets the standard, Switzerland recognises EU. Of those 20 agreements, only three have been rolled over, although they pertain to quite a lot of trade. The other 17 are waiting. They are waiting until the UK has decided whether it will align with EU standards, essentially. The Swiss are obliged, you know, the Swiss have signed and committed to apply EU standards and, uh, and equivalence and recognition, and they therefore cannot recognise 
the processes of someone who doesn't adhere to those things. So this is a case where the agreement between the UK and the EU determines not only EU-UK, uh, but also uh, UK-Switzerland. It's also the case that these agreements cannot achieve um, uh, trade within uh, value chains uh, in exactly the same way as it goes on now. Um, free trade agreements require so-called rules of origin to prove that a good has originated in the partner country to which you're giving uh, the tariff preference. At the moment, Switzerland, EU, anything from France, Germany, and the UK is all added into EU um, content and satisfies the Swiss. Uh, the Swiss have agreed that they will continue to count French and German inputs as if they are British inputs for giving free trade to goods from Britain. So that's okay, getting British goods into the Swiss market. But when a Swiss firm uses those goods and wants to re-export back to the uh, European Union, the European Union has not agreed that it will treat UK origin as if it is Swiss origin. And so goods that are taking a leg, uh, sort of UK to Switzerland into the EU or Switzerland UK into the EU, uh, there is a rule of origin that this bilateral Swiss uh, UK agreement can't touch. It's actually a trilateral business. The European Union needs to be involved and they haven't talked to the European Union and the European Union is uh, not apparently willing to um, uh, vary its rules. Thank you. And just uh, one final question to move on to the future trading relationship between the UK and the EU. We spent some time last week talking about what the uh, US's offensive interests would be given the amount of publicity they've got and how media-friendly talk of coordinated chickens, etc. is. What would the EU's offensive interests be uh, in negotiating the future trading relationship with the UK? So EU... EU Offensive interests are typically first and foremost around agriculture, just like the US. So first and foremost, ge I mean geographical indications, but they are already in the with in the withdrawal agreement. That's how that's how strong an interest that 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 that, it, that, that is. This is both a strong offensive interest in, in in agriculture to make sure that we will accept all of their uh, products. It's also a very strong defensive interest. So we there's been some debate as to whether the EU has never. Um, dropped all tariffs on agriculture for in a in a in a free trade agreement. It, um, there is some debate as to whether they would do so for the UK. Um, that's we don't we don't know that yet. But there will be strong arguments from within the 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 EU that they should still keep some protections on agriculture while ensuring that we are free to take as much uh, ag agriculture as the, as they can have. In terms of industrial tariffs, the EU are very happy to uh, re remove remove most of those, and will be uh, and will will be quite happy to uh, to to do that. I think there will be quite a debate on uh, uh, people, which is uh, mode four is known on, in in in, ser in services that um, the EU are very keen to make sure that they you know people will have a right to work in work in the UK to be transferred within 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 companies. That will be uh, certainly one of their um, str strong interests, I think. Certainly, also the whole U.S. Um, voluntary standards infrastructure, what's called technical barriers to trade in, tra in trade agreements. Speak. They are very keen to make sure that the um, as many countries as possible follow their um, their, their, their vo the follow European voluntary standards, particularly in the um, in in the European region, um, and also align pretty strongly on regulations so that um, essentially you don't have to go through double testing if, you, if, if, a, if a car is safe in Germany, it's safe in the, in the UK. So that is something that they will also want to, uh, to, to achieve. Um, I'm try, trying to think, I think those are, the ma those are the main things that they, were, that they always prioritise. I've probably missed one or two which colleagues will add to. So I would probably say, uh, I would pick up on two points um, David made right from the start. I think there has been an assumption in a lot of the discourse around a future trading relationship that zero for zero tariffs are a given, that is, that it's automatic. But I, I don't think, I'm not as 
uh, comfortable with that uh, as others. I think the EU will face very, very strong internal pressure to say, well, if we have, if we do have a no deal, if we are starting from a place of WTO terms, why don't we treat this like any other free trade uh, agreement negotiation where there are some tariffs we are willing to cut, such as in industrials. There may be some agricultural products that we are willing to cut, but we do not simply as a basis, as move one of the chess game, put on the table zero for zero tariffs. So I think agricultural market access and defensiveness will definitely be one of them. I'll probably expand the, this kind of notion of standards and regulations. Um, the EU is sometimes described as a regulatory superpower. Um, Compared to compared to U.S. and China, they have placed a lot of their kind of soft power view of the world in this ability that once the EU has set a standard or regulation, that begins to define their region. Um, in addition to what David said, the EU has a very strong interest in that when it establishes a standard or regulation, uh, those often it involve some cost to EU businesses. Um, the EU has a strong interest that as many people as possible also have to adopt, as many countries as possible have to adopt that standard and regulation so they can't be undercut by partners that don't follow that regulation, that produce in a less costly but perhaps, I don't know, less environmentally sensitive or less labour-friendly way. Um, the third point I make is to, if you examine the, the, the way that the UK talks about what it wants out of future trade agreements and trade policy in general, um, it's probably, it, it's, you can transpose that onto the EU. When, we t when either major party in the United Kingdom at the uh, Westminster level talks about uh, trade, they talk about jobs and they talk about attracting good, high-paying jobs. Um, they want to take back control of their policies in such a way that they can structure their economy to attract jobs and capital into the United Kingdom. Um, as I think it was Ivan Rogers said, the, the one thing about taking back control is that the other side gets to take back control too. Um, and so there is a, um, if you are in the European Union, uh, if I was a, an EU member state or if I was advising an EU member state, I would be looking at the kind of jobs that are currently being done in the United Kingdom and on sold into the EU or which rely on access into the EU and looking at are there ways that we can, without being massively disruptive and without hurting our own economies, structure our standards, regulations and trade policy in a way that creates nudge factors to move those jobs to, to Ireland, to, to Luxembourg, to, to you name it. Um, and so I think w uh, what you will find is that they will look for opportunities to do that um, in sectors like finance, where, the, um, where part of the competitive advantage of UK firms has been the fact that you can use them as a gateway into Europe. Now, if that gateway becomes a tighter squeeze, will firms look to base their capital in EU member states or countries with greater access to EU member states? I think that's... That's a real possibility. And I think it's fair to expect the European Union to approach this with the exact same kind of um, interest base as the UK does, which is how do we get these good jobs? How do we get these like ca capital? Can I add to just a to very briefly, um, a very clear, strong offensive interest, not one that will cause us much difficulty, I don't think, but would be state aids, regulations, and competition. And the second thing I'd want mention is the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation. Um, uh, the UK have made fairly encouraging noises about aligning with that, but if we were to go off and try and join the uh, comprehensive um, uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership, that, ha that has uh, rules about um, um, e-commerce uh, data regulation that are not necessarily compatible with the GDPR. And so the EU, I think, in any negotiation, would want to insist that the UK um, adhered essentially to the GDPR. Thank you very much. Kenneth Gibson. Hey, thanks very much, convener. It's a truly fascinating and disconcerting discussion, it has to be said, and I think it shows the kind of naivety of some of the Brexiteers has been somewhat exposed. I mean, Professor Winters, you talked uh, just a second ago, you, you, you touched on uh, competitiveness. I mean, how concerned are you and other members of the panel that what we could see through this entire exercise is effectively a return to increased uh, protectionism across uh, not just uh, Europe but beyond? Um, well, let me talk about the United Kingdom. Um, 
the, there is no doubt that the United Kingdom is going to become less competitive in world terms. We're just incurring all of these extra costs. We're fragmenting a market. We don't have a domestic market. And so British firms will come under a lot of pressure. I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, we are also taking back control of a trade policy instrument, as the chair referred to right at the beginning, of something we've never, we haven't done for 40 years, have very little experience at a bureaucratic level, and just about no experience at all of discussing at a political level. So you think about anti-dumping duties, uh, the British government would say, well, it, we can't put anti-dumping duties, the European, we would put anti-dumping duties on steel to help South Wales, but the European Union won't let us. That was not true. We had, um, in Europe, argued not to have anti-dumping duties. Those sorts of things, they're our problem now. So I think we, in Britain, face a world where British firms are going to come under serious pressure. Uh, political life is not going to settle down very much. We've not had a debate about exactly uh, how we want to respond to issues of open trade and so on. There are zealots who say free trade is necessarily a good thing. There are some zealots on the other side who say it's a very dangerous thing. It's just no resolution of that. So my prediction is that the UK is going to slip into quite a lot of ad hoc protection over the next decade or so. Colleagues jump in there. I was just wondering um, your views on the issue of public procurement, because another issue that was raised before the referendum, not so much since, it seems to me, is about oh, um, we can we can buy British and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, obviously the, the the issue of comparative advantage being completely ignored in this kind of argument, but the idea is oh, um, we don't have to, you know, buy a a ferry at a, a Polish yard, we can ensure that it's a British yard or whatever it happens to be. Um, uh, what's your view on public procurement and how that would be impacted? Because obviously if there's a reduction in competitiveness, then the, the cost uh, to, the pub, to the public purse would, one, expect increase as well as um, the impact perhaps on quality and delivery. Well, the European Union you know, over history has focused a lot on public procurement as a sort of matter of market access. Um, it bound quite a lot of that in the World Trade Organization Government Procurement Agreement, and we have just acceded to that. And as I understand it, although I confess I have not read the schedule, my understanding is that the UK is basically rolling over that same set of commitments. And so at least relative to the 42, 43 other members of the Government Procurement Agreement, uh, we cannot discriminate very much against them. I think there is bits that we can discriminate um, where Europe offers a constraint, but not very much. So I think you're exactly right. There will be pressures to use government procurement as an instrument, but there will remain constraints. Um, I'm afraid I can't say exactly how much uh, looser they will be. Um, I I was going to pick up the, uh, the sort of the, 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 the global agenda part of that, that question as well. I mean, clearly, uh, in the last five to ten years, uh, trade policy, trade agreements have become more and more unpopular. So there was this idea really before that trade agreements are great. Nobody, nobody loses. Everybody, everybody gains. Maybe not a huge amount, but we all gain. So let's do lots of trade agreements. And what we've seen in recent years with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, the uh, uh, TTIP, uh, potential EU-US agreement, and frankly, even a UK-US agreement is the large number of people are saying, well, hang on a minute, maybe trade isn't that great because, uh, you know, we have to put up with the, with US food standards that we don't want or, you know, it means that job, jobs leave the country or, what, or, or whatever. Some of the criticisms are fair. Some of the criticisms are less than fair. But clearly you see from the US um, in their objectives for a UK trade agreement or uh, an EU trade agreement, they are very much U.S. first. In fact, they're pretty much U.S. first and only. Uh, we we want this, and we're not really prepared to give anything. It's pretty much the uh, the U.S. objectives. Um, you know, the WTO is at best is under strain. There's no sign of new anything new new agreements at the WTO. The appellate body that 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 hears appeals to disputes is kind of pretty much on the on the on the verge because it doesn't have uh, the EU, the US is vetoing new uh, new new members so there's a problem there and yet this comes against the fact that uh, production including of services and services embedded in man, in, man, in manufacturing which is pretty important now are now increasingly on a maybe not so much of a global value chain approach they've 
typically regional though, the, the production, you know, a, a supplier in Scotland will be supplying uh, things to Germany and then pit parts will come back to, I don't know, somewhere in England. And you've got pit parts, um, you know, moving around Europe or around the, or around the globe in ways that um, are hard to understand and no one's really sort of fully researched this. So the UK at this moment moving outside of that um, yeah, it, yes, it's going to have a pr pretty, pretty unpredictable, and we don't really know. You know, if President Trump is re-elected, what's the, you know, the WTO is, a, you know, best survival is probably the uh, the goal. It's hard to see it thriving in the next uh, in the next four to five years. So there's a there's clearly a a lot of a lot of tensions in the system, and we're adding to them. Yeah, I mean, n not a huge amount to add on that. Maybe to start working backwards a little bit. Um, the the U.S. problems with the WTO predate Trump. The appellate body blockade, so the the U.S. refusal to appoint new judges to the the Supreme Court of the WTO, so to speak, has been is an Obama, I think, era policy, if not even before that. Um, so this isn't necessarily, uh, you know, a, a a short term thing that is very tied up in in one particular individual administration. This is a longer run problem. I do draw some solace from the fact that. Um, you know, we uh, there was a financial crisis, a global financial crisis, and while protectionism worldwide ticked up in terms of the indices of non-tariff barriers, what you didn't see was a global movement to uh, shrug off the WTO rules and simply raise tariffs as you had in the 1930s. Um, so, so in a way, in the face of um, probably the economic downturn of of the early part of the 21st century, the global trading system actually withstood that test better than some of the more pessimistic people thought it would, which gives some, some cause for hope that there will be a pushback against this protectionism. Even current US attempts at protectionism in steel, uh, aluminum, and the way they're engaging with China are facing a lot of domestic pushback. The steel industry is happy with them, but no one else in the country appears to be. Um, and the threatened tariffs on, on EU cars haven't materialized. The trade spat with China doesn't appear to be going very well. Um, so, so in a way, the um, there has been a kind of reaching for protectionism and getting singed on the part of a very protectionist US administration, which hopefully has given has given others worldwide pause. But I definitely agree with David that the temptation is going to be there. Um, trade policy hates nothing more than haste and lack of preparation. Uh, by necessity, the Brexit process forces a lot of haste and cuts down on the amount of preparation. And when that happens, protectionism is often the easiest lever to pull to get a friendly headline. Um, that is simply the nature of protectionist policy. And so that temptation is certainly going to be there. Um, and it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see how well the, the government can resist that temptation where that temptation doesn't lead down a constructive route. Indeed, can I just ask one on. It's just one question to David could, specifically could, could about Going over time, so if yeah. we could have them um, uh, succinct answers, it would yeah. be very helpful. Yeah, it's just a brief one. It's just that in, in David's paper, he talks. He says it's, it's disappointing that there are so few areas in which the UK government appears to be ready to openly discuss trade policy as a prelude to deploy, deployment, and this is largely a reflection of continued secrecy, given how uh, little has been revealed in terms of policy goals or even why priorities have been chosen. And that's very much what we've been talking about already. That you know. Lots of preparatory work has been done, very little shared. We don't know anything about what the government thinks about defensive or offensive interests in particular. We're having to guess quite a lot. Into the tunnel on that? Uh, not as far as I can see. There might, there might be a change of leadership soon. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, Thanks, th Kavina. Thanks very much. And before we move on, I, I know that uh, Professor Winters has to leave to catch a flight, which we understand. So. If you had wanted to come in first with the next questions, that would be welcome. Uh, Annabel Ewing. Uh, thank you. Good morning, uh, gentlemen. Um, turning to the no deal scenario, which sadly is still very much uh, out there, uh, and looking at the approach that the UK government has adopted thus far on the uh, tariff regime for a no deal Brexit, uh, I mean, just picking up on Professor Winter's point there, I mean, this change of 
um, PM apparently that's coming maybe if the conditions are met at some point, date unspecified, uh, replaced by whom we don't know. Will that person be elected? No, it seems by us. In any event, um, so if there's a new PM, presumably they can just change their mind and have another approach to tariffs, could they? Um, uh, legally so, yes. The, um, uh, the uh, structure under which tariffs are settled is uh, but basically legislative, but the level at which tariffs are settled is an administrative issue. So the government would be able to um, uh, change its tariff structure if it was so moved. Um, I don't know that I would predict that that would be some, the first thing that would get changed. Um, the tariff schedule for no deal that was announced uh, two, three weeks ago you know, is only announced for a year. Um, and so there will be, I think, pressure to uh, consider changes to it. Um, but my honest guess is that we will tend to, f we will find that the, the UK will tend to be a bit more liberal than the EU is currently on tariffs, at least so far as uh, sort of the regular uh, most favoured nation tariffs concerned. We might not be so liberal when it can, comes to anti-dumping duties. I think we might find quite a spate of them. Certainly, to pick up on my previous point, the, the, the level of secrecy that is, has been associated with the last two or three years, uh, yes, governments quite like being secret, but it, is, it has gone to levels that I hadn't uh, previously seen, and there is no requirement for trade policy to be really quite, quite as secret as it has been. In fact, if anything, as we've been arguing all morning, pretty much the opposite. Uh, the one point I'd make is that if, if you talk to business, they will sometimes even prefer a higher tariff that's set and locked in stone for the next 10 years to a lower tariff that might change every six months. So I think the government is going to face a lot of pressure from business groups, um, even over this kind of, this is what the tariffs are for a year. If they start also changing it every time the winds inside Westminster start blowing in a different direction, you're going to have business groups tearing their hair out. Because sometimes these tariffs and the tariff levels determine where one makes an investment in, say, factory construction or a long-term contract that are measured in terms of decades when you're talking about returns of investment. If you're constantly switching that around, um, you make it very, very difficult to make those long-term bets. OK. Um, as we've heard uh, already uh, this morning, and there has been some discussion about general trade policy uh, and how, you know, the, the, the unitary state decides what the priorities are, even if that's to the detriment of component parts of the unitary state, as we have heard with regard to the dairy sector in Scotland. But, I mean, what would have informed the, the UK government's approach? I mean, because I understand there still are some, in an ODO scenario, there still are some uh, uh, tariffs proposed... Uh, but by and large, it is to be a sort of free for all. Uh, so, how did what informed their approach to how they divvied up the list? What, what, well, I what say, do you I think, think informed their approach? I mean, I think this was done, you know, on a wet Thursday afternoon by a couple of thirty-year-olds. Um, it, it, uh, it was, it was. Uh, I'm allowed to say that at my age. Um, <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think that it was, it, it's a sort of balance between two conflicting forces. One is competitive pressure on British firms, and the other, something which has figured large in the rhetoric of some Brexiteers, and in particular of Dr. Fox, is that tariffs raise the cost of living. They increase the cost of consumers. Um, no deal Brexit is certainly going to be greeted by a decline in the value of the pound, so prices of imports will be going up anyway, and by removing some of the tariffs, you ease a bit of the pain. So I think that was the trade-off, and very broadly speaking, at least until you come to talk about specific sectors, maybe they uh, called that a bit right. If you look at the sectors that uh, maintain protection, they are very sensitive sectors in agriculture, parts of agriculture, one or two bits cut loose, but uh, not all of them. Uh, cars is uh, the most obvious of the industrial products. And I think you just recognise those as being, in a sense, the big players politically in our processes. Uh, the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders is an extremely well-organised lobby. Uh, the National Farmers Union is an extremely well 
um, um, organized lobby. So I think that was just a very broad trade-off, and um, it was, you know, in a sense, it was well work something out that conforms to these broad parameters, and that was the answer they got. Even the tariffs that we've got, I've mentioned already, they actually are still set in euro, which is perverse. Uh, they actually have been basically sort of... Uh, uh, um, the, the, the reduction in our tariffs relative to the European uh, Euro, um, Union tariff is not, um, as it were, something that shows signs of very careful calculation. In pork, it's a decline of 13%. In other sectors, it's a decline of 40%. Across the whole sort of set of sub-areas. So I think we shouldn't try to read a great deal of rationality uh, sort of into the basic structure. The basic idea that tariffs, lowering tariffs will reduce the cost of living and reduce the cost of inputs is a legitimate one, and economists do believe that tariffs in general don't help economic efficiency. Um, but beyond that broad statement, I don't think, I wouldn't overinterpret it. I think that there were. I think that the process started with, us, with with various government ministers. You can guess who saying, "What if we have no tariffs whatsoever?" And then say, and then which people are going to yell most if we, if that's not the case? And we found that the people who yelled most were many of the people that uh, that Alan already mentioned. I think you should also mention the um, the, the de developing the development lobby, developing countries, because developing countries at the moment have preferences. This is often uh, willfully ignored by those who um, su suggest that we go zero tariff. They complain that uh, developing countries pay tariffs to, for their products going into the EU, which is not true. Most developing countries, most of their exports are, ta are tariff-free. But in order for that to mean something, others have to pay tariffs. So on some of the key areas like uh, textiles, bananas and sugar, tariffs, tariffs were maintained. So that was certainly an interest that was in there. Um, Alan already mentioned the, the, produce, the produce level. But I think the most important thing I would say is this was all done at really big sort of macro level. We, we, we keep talking about this detail, detail, detail. Did somebody go through the sort of individual lines or the individual segments and say, what's the impact going to be on this individual segment? Well, I'm still waiting for the official impact assessment and I expect to be waiting for a fair while. The, the, I tend to be very cynical about how these these mandates are formed, and I think it's impossible to dismiss the impact of what is in the news on stuff like this. You look at the sectors that retain the highest protection, um, areas like lamb, the fact that cars were essentially unmoved. These are These are product lines that aren't inherently more sensitive than some of the others. Why was the egg tariff eliminated entirely and the lamb tariff reduced the least out of the agricultural products? Uh, I don't necessarily know, given that the NFU have said how little consultation there was with them and with farmers, that this was a, uh, as David said, a deep analysis of you know competitiveness in those two sectors versus the fact that perhaps lamb and cars have been making headlines non-stop for a year and a half um, and, and eggs haven't. Um, now, I'm not saying that that is actually what motivated it, but in the absence of those impact assessments, um, it's, it's hard not to draw the conclusion that that would have been an important um, that would have been an important factor. I would also add, I think economists will say that uh, tariffs have a, have, an, have a dampening effect on, on efficiency. But I think there's a misconception in the general public when we talk about cutting tariffs and cutting prices. They picture cutting prices at the supermarket when except in exceptionally high, except in areas of exceptionally high tariffs where there aren't free trade agreements and prefer preferences. Uh, Customers in supermarkets are very unlikely to see decreases in prices due to tariff cuts because of the, the structures of production and where the tariff comes in at the value chain in terms of prices. Um, where economists tend to point to efficiency gains is in uh, gains for business. This is why, for example, steel and aluminum tariffs, which uh, thousands of businesses need as inputs are uh, much, much more inefficient than a tariff on a, on a final product um, and much more felt by the economy. So it's important to set expectations for consumers realistically about what they're likely to see at Sainsbury's uh, after a tariff cut. Okay. Um, has the, do you think the UK government has rather tied its hands going forward, having started with a zero tariff deal? 
Sorry, I didn't catch Sorry. the question. Sorry. So in terms of uh, the, the f future trade deals being negotiated, could it be argued that the UK has rather tied its hand, having set the, the base level at zero? Where does it go from zero? Yes, indeed. Um, the, um, uh, a, 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 trade, a trade agreement negotiation is I give you something and you give me something back, and if we haven't got anything to offer, uh, that makes the trade agreement uh, more difficult. Uh, we have retained a number of tariffs. You know, Japan, for instance, is going to be extremely interested in the tariff on vehicles. Um, and um, you know, America, Australia are interested in the tariffs on agriculture. So in a sense, we haven't uh, got rid of all our ammunition. And um, uh, yeah, so, uh, but it, it clearly is. It clearly is not helpful towards negotiating trade agreements. Um, but um, you know, it, that that is one consideration. In general, um, I think we have actually rather too high expectations of what trade agreements might deliver anyway, and therefore sort of slightly weakening our bargaining hand is not that much of a, you know, of a problem. Um, uh, but yes, it, it, it clearly is a trade-off, exactly as you say. Um, I ju just, just to add that what it does remove from our trade agreements is the ability to offer not very painful things in trade agreements. So there's a whole load of industrial tariffs that the EU has that are between 0 and 5%, which they are basically only too happy to remove in trade agreements because it doesn't really cost them very much and produces very much to actually do it. Now, if we don't have those tariffs to, to start with, we're going straight for the painful ones to us. And therefore, trade agreements, There, you know, Alan's point is right, of course, we expect too much of trade agreements. But if we're going to do them, it's helpful to have something easy to offer. If we have to go straight into, right, um, sh you know, let's, t let's talk about la uh, la lamb uh, tariffs or whatever, that's, go that's going to be more difficult. With that said, if I, as a trade negotiator, if you are offering me things that are easy, um, and you are asking of me to give you things that are hard for me, I'm not going to be ready to make that trade, in part because I know that every free trade agreement you do, the first thing you're going to do is here are these easy 5% tariffs. So I recognise that every single discussion you have from now on in will undercut whatever advantage I win through this free trade agreement. So did it, does it tie the UK's hands somewhat? What it does is, as you say, if you want something hard from the US, if there is an offensive interest you want that they don't want to move on, you should expect that you're not going to get away with being able to give 5% tariffs back. They're going to come after the things that you don't want to move on because that for them is an equivalent trade. So it won't necessarily bind the UK's hands any more than they would already be bound by the fact that asks from other countries are probably going to be in areas where the UK doesn't want to move. Um, interesting. One last brief, very brief question. Uh, Professor Winter referred to uh, the possibility of uh, the UK uh, having greater rec well, having recourse, because it's a DG1 matter of the Commission, to anti-dumping uh, 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 charges. Um, I, I had, I've actually practised anti-dumping law some years ago in Brussels, and I, I had thought that anti-dumping was kind of not on its way out, but it was seen as a bit of a clumsy uh, international trade tool. Uh, so uh, are you anticipating that... Uh, I mean, there's the question as to whether anybody in the UK government has the expertise to actually deal with anti-dumping work, but leaving that to one side, are you anticipating that this would become the norm for the UK government? I mean, obviously, the product has to be dumped, so it has to be so below cost, but... Wow. Is this going to be the norm? Would they, could this apply to former to EU member states? Could this apply to, to EEA countries? Um, is this what the UK government is well, going to you, do to foster yeah, yeah. good relations with its international partners? Ah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you've practised anti-dumping law, you'll know that anti-dumping law is moderately elastic. There are, you know, there's room for interpretation. That's why there's room for lawyers. So, uh, no, I don't, I don't think the technicalities are going to stop us from pursuing quite a lot of anti-dumping duties if we wish to. Um, I think the question about it is, um, I think lawyers, uh, certainly economists, feel, yeah, this is a pretty crude tool and by and large not terribly helpful. It ends up basically protecting uh, less efficient incumbent firms. But it's great politics. It's fabulous politics. It's absolutely targeted at the people who are crying um, that they're being murdered. And uh, it seems that all you're doing is imposing the cost on a bunch of foreigners who are cheating anyway. It, it's perfect politics. Well, and, 
tries to negotiate a deal with the EU27 going forwards in this Brexit no deal scenario, uh, this is going to be helpful to that deal being concluded on favourable terms? Um, if, if, we sign, if we were to sign a customs union, we clearly, clearly would agree there would be no uh, anti-dumping duties. Some free trade agreements also have constraints on the imposition of anti-dumping duties, and it is possible that that is a place that we would end up with. Um, but uh, you know, remember that anti-dumping duties are applied and removing competitive pressure isn't just a matter of the European Union. They have economies rather like ours. The real, in a sense, the real concern is whether we, as an inexperienced and smaller market with a rather fractured political system, uh, can commit ourselves, as it were, not to abuse anti-dumping duties. And you would not have to be as cynical as I often am to believe that there's a danger there. I think that's all I would say. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. That was very interesting. We'll have to move on, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Convena. This has really been quite a fascinating uh, session. We've learned so much from the informative of you, uh, gentlemen. But a number of treaties already have been signed, uh, and those that have, uh, you know, in places like uh, the Faroe Islands or the Pacific Islands, Switzerland, uh, and we've talked about you know, Norway and Iceland coming into that scenario. So, so can I ask, the arrangements for individuals being signed, how were they selected and what made them sign now rather than later? So that's an interesting question. We don't know why, why they've signed, but if we look at a number of the countries concerned, so um, Chile, the Faroe Islands, Israel... Palestinian territories, all of them are quite significant agriculture exporters. And we've already heard that agriculture is a sector typically protected uh, by, by high tariffs. So there's a real incentive on those countries. If you're exporting agriculture, there's a real incentive to actually make sure that that is, it, that is in place. I think that also applies to one or two of the economic partnership agreements with, uh, with developing countries as well. So you can see a, an agriculture thing going through there. And I can see why in those situations you'd say, look, you know, actually, I'll go... I'll, I'll, I'll do this. Um, I, I, you know, I really, I really need to do this. So, um, Chile and Israel, I imagine, for both of them, there's also quite a strong political impetus for different reasons. Chile likes to say that they are the best country to deal with in terms of trade agreements, so they like that as their reputation. Is Israel, you know, there are other political facts about making sure, you know, make, retaining uh, um, friendships. Um, Switzerland and Norway are just more significant trade-wise for their trade as well, so there's, there's something in it for them. So arguably, you can see what's in it for the countries that have that have signed, and with many of the other countries that have yet to sign and we don't quite know where the status is, it's harder to see what's in it for them. Some of these countries don't like the agreements that they had signed with the EU. They think the EU bullied them or, or whatever, with reason, by the way, sometimes, um, and think that they can get a better deal from the from the UK. Some of them don't like the UK terms that, the, that, are, that are being offered. Some of them are saying, uh, you know, we, we can roll this over, but only if you promise a new trade agreement. So there are varying reasons why other countries haven't yet reached it. Some of them, I think, have just not had that much attention because resources just ran out. Various reasons why they didn't happen, but uh, but as I say, you can see the incentive on those that signed. None of them have come as a great surprise. I, I would probably divide it into kind of three categories, the calculus of these countries in considering whether to sign something now. Uh, I would say there is the question of how much do they value stability? How much do they... How much do they perceive the potential gains are of rolling the dice on pushing for greater concessions in the future on kind of what happens if we take this down to the wire? And then the third one is capability. Um, so I think that for some of the countries that have signed on from Faroe Islands, for even for Norway and Switzerland, the most critical thing was to, as quickly as possible, lock in stability. That things the day after Brexit would be as close to the way things are now. They looked at what they could potentially gain down the track in a bilateral with the UK in the absence of it and thought the gains here probably aren't worth potentially not having the stability on day one of Brexit. Disrupting what we have now, not worth it. I think some of the others, your Japan definitely, I suspect Korea as well, have looked at it and gone, well, actually, this is a more traditional FTA where we're, we're not so much making things together through supply chains, but selling things to one another. There, is, there are potential gains here because we will be negotiating with a market significantly smaller than the one we negotiated with to get the EU 
uh, Japan FTA, for example, and we'll be able to push for more. And then some like Turkey, there's a capability issue in terms of in the absence of a deal with the EU, it's just really unclear how a Turkey-UK arrangement w would work um, if it was a rollover. And I mean, I mean, the gains you've talked about uh, in, in comparison for the UK economy, for our exporters, for our consumers, uh, how, do, how do you see that coming through the process? Uh, so, I mean, for the existing agreements, I haven't seen great evidence that that's been a big a big factor. Because I think that again, it was it was done at a really high level of saying our trade agreements are generally good. We need them all. We're going to do them all. Let's do them all. I am not aware of an analysis that says it's really important that we do this one, this one, and this one. I mean, obviously, there is a size, you know, I think there was roughly by size, you know, let's try and do Canada, Korea, Japan. They're the, they're the, they're the biggest ones, but they're obviously going to be the, the toughest ones as well. And, you know, for some of the other countries, in terms of size-wise, you know, some of these countries are thought of as relatively small trading partners, actually pretty significant. I mean, um, Egypt, for example, is, is an example I often use, that political relations are a little tricky, but it's a pretty significant trade relationship there but i don't think that was really picked up and analyzed and said actually we should make egypt a priority i don't think i've certainly never seen anything from government that says here's our priority list and perhaps i wouldn't expect perhaps i wouldn't expect to see that because that would give important information to the other side but i'd certainly expect to see some sign of prioritization and i haven't obviously seen any sign of prioritization and business business friends who uh talk to the de uh, department for international trade on a regular basis don't ever report that being asked, you know, well, if it's between Egypt and uh, Chile, which one's more important to you? I don't recall anyone saying they were asked that question. I, I would probably add um, trade statistics can be really misleading when you talk about size of markets and even size of trade. It, your biggest trading partner could be one where you sell them natural gas and they sell you iron ore. Those two things would probably have 0% tariffs. So even though they are your largest trading partner on paper, doing an FTA with them would not necessarily have any impact on the economy because those are already... Well, two-thirds two of UK-Norway trade is yeah. natural, natural gas yeah. from uh, Norway. And that is uh, often a lot of what makes up like a trade balance in terms of like billions of dollars will be raw commodities that are already... They're almost like apart from the trading system because sometimes they're even you know being shipped into their own ports with entirely different systems. But at that sectoral level... Once you break it down into kind of, uh, think I can't remember if it was David or Alan was talking about legal services into Korea. There, on a sectoral level, on a firm level, there can be really there can be really significant losses and gains. Um, and in terms of the rollovers, if you allow, basically, if the UK drops out and then eventually rebuilds it, the EU will be able to steal a march on them, establish themselves in the market, build a brand. And then it'll just make it harder for the UK, even if it eventually does renegotiate access, to um, to gain a foothold in a market that already has a kind of European presence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tavish Scott. Uh, I just wanted to ask um, one supplementary to uh, Kenny Gibson's earlier question um, about international trade and the international context of the remarks you've been making this morning. Um, how can you be so confident that those international rules, the international rule book on trade, will survive another six years of Trump in the White House? Because he's pretty keen to rip up every international order going. I'm more confident than I was a couple of years ago. How can you be so confident? I don't think I was that confident. Um, I mean, I think the, you know, I think what's happened at a global level is that clearly there was, there has been an attack by Trump. Dimitri's right, there was, to a certain degree, some of this was existing U US policy. Trump kind of amplified it quite considerably. But I think the system, I think people have realised that the system is, imp is important enough to retain and defend. And I think there's a lot of work going on to kind of, you know, <laughs> Trump-proof it to a degree. Make sure that if there is another six years of Trump, the WTO will survive that six years. Um, I mean, certainly talking to countries who had signed the Trans-Pacific Partnership, one of their motivations was, look, this is defence in case the, the WTO ever ceases to exist. Um, I think they're probably more confident now that, you know, it, Trump's not going to destroy it, that there are enough countries that will prevent that happening, and that, um, you know, now he's a kind of 
He's, he's something we're just going to have to put up with for however long we're going to have to put up with him that actually he's probably not going to break the whole system. He's going to put it under a great deal of strain, but he's not going to break it. But that's my view. Dimitri may have a different one. Yeah, so uh, I would say, firstly, the um, in some ways David is, is entirely correct. The, the Trumpian assault on the system has reinforced in the minds of especially middle-income countries, and I use that term very broadly to basically mean everyone under China, China, the US, and NDU, are of the importance of having a predictable rules-based system where they can collectively kind of ch uh, challenge the decisions by the big players. Um, and it's actually seen a resurgence of engagement in the system that, frankly, during my time there was really waning. Um, you know, you couldn't get uh, you couldn't get ministers to care about the WTO at gunpoint um, at some point, and now. It's much more prevalent. It's much more in the news, and they're much more engaged because they, they've they've looked into the darkness and didn't care for what they saw. So from that sense, it's been helpful. The WTO also, in a way, here its its weakness is its strength. In that, for example, the security exemption that the Trump administration is, in my view, abusing or, or threatening to abuse in the case of car tariffs to do all sorts of things, allows them to break the system without shattering it. They are able, essentially the system does allow you to do whatever you want without pulling out of it entirely. Um, and other countries may not like that, but the benefit of a US in the WTO will generally make them hold their nose enough to kind of put out with it and ride out the storm. Trump essentially doesn't need to pull the US out of the WTO in order to do what he needs to do, and that gives us some hope that eventually karma heads will occupy the White House. I think that's very fair. And do you, did you read, or what did you read into the um, Chinese Premier's visit to Paris this week where he met the senior European leaders who are still holding the European Union together? Um, it, should we read much into that in terms of trade policy over the future years? I, t uh, I tend to be uh, fairly cautious when it comes to the Chinese engagement in the global trading system. Um, the story there is that China joined the WTO through an accession process. Uh, essentially, I think it was at the time about 140-way negotiation, where the Chinese feel like they have made they were made to make commitments in excess of what is fair and reasonable. Um, now, I mean, that is actually, it's not, uh, it's not an un entirely unfair gripe. They did have to pay a lot to join the system. And so their position has generally since then been that we are done paying, that future rules should not apply to us because we have, we have given of ourselves as much as we can be reasonably expected to give. Therefore, when the Trump administration began making threatening noises about the system, the Chinese, uh, including the Chinese premier, but at, at every level, started making a lot of noises about being the champions of the system, stepping up to fill the, the leadership void. They were going to be responsible. But when push came to shove, and it's like, that was a great speech in Davos premier, is China prepared to move in terms of making commitments in any of the areas where members have substantial concerns about Chinese practice when it comes to trade? suddenly that conviction wasn't so rock solid. Whether it's on the issue of differentiation between different types of developing countries, Chinese uh, state capitalism, subsidization, IP, the Chinese willingness to match rhetoric with commitments hasn't so far materialized so much. So I tend to say it's fantastic that they still see it as a soft power win and a goal to engage. I think that's, that's great. It's a fantastic system. But I would wait to see whether any pudding comes with the promises. Thank you. Thank you very much. A quick supplementary from Ross. Yeah. Thanks, Commissioner. Um, I'd like to get your thoughts on something that one of the trade lawyers you spoke to last week brought up. Um, they were talking about the, the sequence of the uh, future relationship agreements that the UK negotiates. And they essentially made the point that uh, it would be in the interests of the US to get their deal in ahead of the UK-EU future relationship agreement because it would lock in a lot of the regulatory standards that the US would want to see. Um, I'm interested in your take on both that specific issue of the, the order between the US and the EU, but also the broader issue of the, the sequence of trade agreements and what impact that has. So, 
certainly from a US point of view that would be correct that you know they 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 really they they really there's a regulatory battle um Dimitri alluded to this earlier between the US and the EU the EU has been winning because uh, and the reason it's been winning is it's partly structural in the US because the US federal level can't always regulate for the for the states the EU will just regulate for more of the global economy than the than the US will and then uh, and then businesses want to 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 kind of stick with this and and start um you know other countries start to follow um so the EU's been winning the US uh, spies the UK as a chance to uh, you know strike back if you like uh, so you know if if you, if you don't mind us being a pawn in the uh, in a in a battle between the the EU and the US it would make sense for the US to to get to get in first and to make sure that we don't have geographical indications EU standards on f on food generally uh, European European voluntary standards um, but there would be it, that would be hugely controversial if they if they were to do that because essentially what you'd be doing is you would be putting barriers to UK EU trade, which is fifty percent of our trade, to support twenty percent of our trade, which is with the which is with the US. Uh, but that's that's a battle that may we may see depending on our relationship with the uh, with the EU. Um, in terms of other sequencing, there's nothing. There's nothing really like that. That's that's the unique one, US and EU. Nobody else really want, expects that we're going to change our, our standards or regulations to, uh, to to suit them. So in terms of the other sequencing, arguably what you're wanting to do is to start with one or two more straightforward that probably don't have much economic benefit but are allow you to get your kind of model of what you want to do first before moving on to the more complicated ones and i think there's a big question we talk a lot about a u.s trade deal and very little about a china or india or brazil mainly because those countries are much harder frankly to do trade agreements with but there is a question as to whether we can realistically gain much more from a u.s trade agreement when trade is already strong and whether if you were going to do this properly and look at the potential growth areas you would actually go for a more challenging market because after all in a, in a way wasn't you know if you have control you know, it's almost sort of depressingly sort of dull to sort of go with, oh, well, let's go with the U the US. That's that's kind of, that's a pretty lazy approach. Actually, you know, okay, China, yeah, it's incredibly, horribly difficult to get a good trade agreement, but there's got to be more new opportunities that we haven't exploited in tr terms of trade with China than there are with the US, which is often a company's first thought in terms of expansion is the US. Dimitri will have views. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Um, so, so first, I think uh, it's it's important not to think of this uh, this sequencing issue as an inevitable problem. A US FTA could be a problem for EU for an FTA with the EU if the UK makes commitments in areas that are contradictory with the commitments they would need to make in the EU. Now, as David very correctly points out, the US is going to push for a lot of those commitments as part of this larger strategy, but also for commercial reasons. But they can't make the UK adopt a commitment it doesn't want to adopt. There is the Australia has an FTA with the US um, and is going is negotiating one now with the EU. It is possible to have an FTA with both, um, provide, uh, but you need to not have those internal contradictions. So first, it's, it's important not to think about the not to think about it as an inevitable. If you see an, a US FTA first, it doesn't necessarily mean that the UK has given up on having an EU FTA. It's it's about the content, um, but there will be a lot of pressure. Um, the second point I make on sequencing is that. Um, trade negotiations can be slightly precedential in the sense that when I am negotiating with uh, my counterparts, uh, the strongest argument I can make when they are making a demand of me is that it is simply something I cannot do. It is simple. I cannot accommodate this. If I have given, if I have given ground on that in a different free trade agreement, then their response to me will, will be, well, yes, you can. You gave Chile access to your beef market. Why can't we have that too? So in a way, the sequencing can matter, which is because if you rushed into free trade agreements early that made a range of commitments to, to various players, those commitments will be used by subsequent uh, partners to determine your actual level of flexibility and where your actual red, red lines might be. Very much. Uh, just to conclude, to, to bring us back to Scotland's uh, situation and to drill down on the question that Kenneth Gibson asked earlier about 
uh, public uh, procurement. Uh, in our previous panel last week, we talked a bit about public markets as well. Now, the Scottish NHS is independent of the NHS in England and Wales, and I think it's fair to say there's been less marketisation in the Scottish NHS than there has been in the NHS in England and Wales. Um, I know that you're not experts in the UK constitution, you're clearly experts in international trade deals, but what could we do, if anything, to protect our NHS here in Scotland um, from uh, being opened up in an international trade deal negotiated at UK level? So part of that will depend on whether, you know, to the extent to which it already already has been and i don't and i'm afraid i don't know what access what commitments are part of uh uh government procurement agreement so that's at, we've given a baseline i can't couldn't honestly tell you but you know that would be the first question what's what's in what's in our baseline the the, the second question and and i think the most important thing is that public it is widely recognized by many countries and this has always been the case in the eu that public services are different that countries can if they want open them up but it is not considered to be a great surprise if they choose to protect them to to a degree and even um yeah there was there was a report by some extreme extreme free market um think tanks on an ideal uk us free trade agreement and even they recognized that the uk might want to exclude the nhs from such an agreement so it's widely recognized that this can that 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 is a fair thing to do then in terms of the actual agreements, there's two or three things that one can do. So in some trade agreements, there is um, what's what's known as, a, I think it's the, the ratchet, that it, or is it standstill? Anyway, in some trade agreements, there is the, the, the concept that once you've opened up, you can't take, you can't sort of take it back. So avoid that. You know, you can, you can, you know, make sure that if you are opening up, it is just very specifically in a particular instance, and you can, it can be reversed in the future, and you can do that. Um, and also, in terms of services, you can say there's a difference between a positive, what's known as a positive list, and what's known as a negative list. A negative list says everything is open except what we list here. A positive list says only these things that we list is open, are open. And the positive list tends to be, if you're wanting to protect something, you prefer that. And you can hybrid and you can do... There's, there's all manner of clever detail in there that I'm afraid that I'm not the expert detail, on. Would that extend to being... I mean, if, if the UK, if the NHS in all parts of the UK is excluded, there's no problem. But um, would it be possible to say that... Um, only the, the NHS in Scotland was excluded if the UK government wished to open up the NHS in England. Would it be possible to say that? Uh, so, yes, uh, absolutely. Services, uh, this would be covered in either a procurement schedule or a, or a services schedule, and you can include um, almost anything you want. Uh, free, free trade agreements are agreements between governments, and if the UK and, for example, the US uh, agree that the UK will open up parts of the NHS but not the Scottish NHS. It is entirely legitimate to write that into a free trade agreement provided both sides are comfortable. To answer your, to answer your earlier question, though, I come at this from a, perhaps a different angle than, than David. Um, I, I think, in a way, you're actually all much more qualified to answer this question than us because trade agreements, especially when they concern things like the NHS, are inherently political. If you are genuinely concerned that the Scottish NHS will face a threat from potential commitments made by the UK government in the interest of securing a trade deal with whomever, then the best tool you have is not clever legal instruments. It is to raise the political costs of such a commitment. Um, so my kind of my recommendation is if that's a genuine concern, study the potential implications, specifically what what would be what would be detrimental commitments to the Scottish NHS if they were made. Make sure that your constituents and the public are well informed that this is a risk and make sure that the make sure that there is in in formulating this mandate that we all spoke about at the very start of the discussion you ideally want to make sure that the political considerations around opening up the Scottish NHS are first and foremost on that list of defensive interests. That's very interesting. And to go back to the point that you made about the mandate at the very beginning, you talked about getting a mechanism that the government was, in, was involved, that the Scottish government was involved in setting that mandate. And um, 
possibly through you know a joint committee or whatever. But in, in Europe, when Europe negotiates trade deals, the Trade Committee in the European Parliament has an involvement. Um, given that, you know, if we're talking about the NHS, for example, it's a good example, there's probably consensus right across this parliament that the NHS in Scotland should be protected. So therefore, should this parliament have a degree of oversight into trade deals in addition to the Scottish Government? And how would you see that working? I think, that the, yes, you should have a degree of oversight, and, you use it, and, and that would be exactly the right phrase, I think, is that, you know, again, we were talking before about making sure you didn't get to any kind of veto situation, and yes, during, I think, I think Professor Winters actually addressed this to a degree, that during a negotiation, we, I would expect that the Scottish Parliament or this committee or another committee was able to subject uh, the officials negotiating an agreement to to, sc to scrutiny, if need be, behind closed doors, and to actually ask, ask these questions of the people negotiating. Are we protecting this? Are we protecting that? How have you made sure Scottish interests are protected? What are the Scottish interests? And to actually ha and to make sure that you have a, a strong, um, a basically, f feedback loop to the, the negotiators. That may well not happen in public, and there, there's bound to be. There's always a degree of sort of public... Uh, you know, pressure on negotiators, but behind the scenes, you need to have one Team UK approach, I guess, you know, you need to have, and everyone has to be on the same side, because another thing is, one of the few things, we've mentioned so many things, there's one other thing we, I, I think we haven't mentioned, is that one of the things we haven't done in the EU negotiation is, there's never been a single Team UK approach, that if the, if the EU came to any particular part of the UK system, whether the Scottish Government, the UK Government, business, they get completely different answers about what our priorities would be or what's going on. When you get into trade negotiations, the more people who can be on the same side and say, this is what we've all agreed, the stronger you're going to be and the, the less able another country is to sort of pick, pick different parts off and sort of disagree with them. Um, and therefore, it's in, it would be in the UK negotiators' interest to make sure that you're all happy. Uh, I would probably add, uh, add two points to that. First, I would come back to this kind of look local versus macro question. Um, I've I've trained DIT negotiators over the last couple of months. They're very bright, very dedicated people who genuinely do care. Like they, they ask me about the, the devolved competencies. They care, but are any of them experts on the way that the Scottish NHS procurement defers from the Great Britain NHS procurement or so from, from the England NHS procurement? The odds of that, I mean, maybe, that maybe, but I, I would very much doubt it. Um, so there's kind of a knowledge gap to bridge, which isn't a slight at the negotiators. It's just inevitable. Trade agreements cover so much, you can't physically be an expert in all of it. Um, and now I've just forgotten my second point, um, but I'm sure it was equally wise. <laughs> Well, as it happens, we've run out of time, but that's really fascinating. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us today. It's been very useful, and I'll now move into a private session. Thank you very much.